thank you all for joining us today. Um, a nice blustery day. I was uh, telling our presenter that I was in Madison this morning and it was snowing. So there we go. Did it snow here too? I'm just gonna leave it there, so. Okay, um, if you have a phone or anything that makes noise, would you please put that on silent so that we don't um, interrupt today's lecture? Uh, we will uh, hear from our presenter for a bit and then we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. Um, and our presenter, I'm sure, will stay for your questions as well. Um, I also wanted to remind you that here at Fairhaven, they have asked that masks be worn in the public areas, in the, in the common area hallways. So please remember to put your uh, mask on as you leave today. We would appreciate that. We are about halfway through with our lecture series for the fall. The schedule is out, out uh, on the back if you want to see what we still have left in store for you, which are some pretty good lectures. So um, we still have a little bit left e uh, yet this semester. Um, I'm Carrie Bourne. I'm from the Office of Continuing Education at UW-Whitewater. And we have hosted the Fairhaven Lecture Series here at Fairhaven Senior Services since 19. 1983. Um, so next year we'll be celebrating 40 years here um, for the lecture series. We're super proud of that. So thank you for having us. Um, every year we present lectures on a theme and this semester we're, we're rediscovering Wisconsin. Um, and I think you'll enjoy today, today's lecture about our indigenous people of Wisconsin. I'll introduce the presenter. Michael Gano is an associate professor in the philosophy and religious studies department at UW-Whitewater. After graduating with a BA from Louisiana State University, he went on to receive his MA and PhD in religion from Florida State University. He specializes in American religious history and Native American and religions in particular. He has researched and written on a range of Native American groups and topics from the effigy mound cultures of Wisconsin to Pueblo religions of colonial New Spain to the relationship between Native American religions and contemporary U.S. legislation. Please welcome Dr. Michael Gano. All right. Well, good afternoon and uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it always is uh, a great privilege whenever I get to come and talk to y'all. Uh, as I always say, it's an opportunity I'm going to jump at every time. Uh, it's rare that I get to speak to uh, a group of people who want to be there. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for this. Uh, appreciate that. All right. Uh, so. Uh, as part of the Rediscovering Wisconsin series, I was inv invited to talk about Native peoples of Wisconsin, uh, entitled the lecture First Nations, or the Indigenous Peoples and Spirituality of Wisconsin. So let's get into it. If I can get one thing across in the course of this talk, it is just to remind you that Native peoples still exist. Um, while we're rediscovering Wisconsin, let's remember that there are Native peoples here in Wisconsin, and there always have been. That uh, seemingly simple point is not something that all settlers have always been aware of. When you read the first documents of uh, whitewater colonists, the people who came over to settle and build uh, log cabins in this land, you can read in their diaries of them arriving into a land that is empty and free of native peoples. They write about how they're saddened that those people have just disappeared and gone away. Look at their still smoldering huts on the river. What, what, what? Why are the, the huts on fire? Um, because they were forcibly removed by the soldiers and we just don't talk about that in the newspaper and uh, the personal uh, histories recorded from the first generation of whitewater settlers. They talked about how there were no native peoples in this land and they don't give us any problem except when they stop by from time to time asking for food. They, they aren't here, but they're not a bad people when they are. They just didn't recognize that native peoples were still a part of the landscape their understanding of how they were settling the land necessitated that Native people must be disappearing and going away. But Native peoples have always been a part of Wisconsin. Even during the period of forced removal, 
Native peoples continue to remain here. They returned here. Even today, Native settlements can be found throughout the state of Wisconsin. Most of these are not what we would think of as reservations. They're lands that Native communities, pooling their resources and money, bought for the community. It's lands owned by the equivalent of what we might think of as a corporation, but a community betterment corporation. If you speak of native lands, though, do a Google search, you'll often find maps that look like this. To remind you that wherever we are in Wisconsin, we are living on native land. Native land that was acquired sometimes through land sale, sometimes not so much. And to remind us of that status, that we are standing on land that is native owned by our own treaties, I'm introducing the term First Nations. It's not a word we use much in America. Uh, we use instead Native American or Indian. But it's a term that's pretty common just north of the border. In Canada, the proper legal term we're referring to indigenous people is First Nations people, to remind us that they were the nations who were here in this land first. A nation not in the sense of like a country, but nation as in self-governing, culturally united people. I don't actually like maps like this. They do their function. They convey a sense of ownership of the land, but they're just not historically accurate. Uh, many of these people didn't own territory. Um, they didn't have a concept of owning territory, much less have clearly defined borders. Many of these peoples on the map didn't exist at the same time as other peoples on this map. And before these people were here, there were other peoples who were indigenous to this land. So what time period, what decade or century are we choosing to take a snapshot of to create a picture like this? To try to talk about the native spiritualities of Wisconsin is an overwhelming task. It would be a semester. Uh, definitely more than 40 minutes. Certainly, if you grew up in the area or lived in the area for a while, you've probably seen at least some of these names. These are some of the people who have or did live in what is now Wisconsin. Oneida, Mohican, Oneida, Wyandot, Haudenosaunee, Mississippian, or other names that you might have heard, um, Huron, Iroquois, Ojibwe or Chippewa, Ottawa, Potawatomi, Potawatomi, Anishinaabe, Dakota, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, all of these people lived at least at some point in this land that we now call Wisconsin. Of them, I'm going to try to focus on one because I figured that's all we really have time to uh, tentatively cover. So that's the Ho-Chunk. Why? Because of all of these, I'm, I would argue that Ho-Chunk are the most Wisconsin. At least half of the names on this list um, are indigenous people. They are Native American, and they are natives of Wisconsin. But that doesn't mean that their culture was born in Wisconsin. It means that they were here prior to the arrival of white people, Europeans and Euro-Americans. Of these... Several, but most notably the Ho-Chunk, were born here in Wisconsin, originated here in Wisconsin from another culture that originated here in Wisconsin. And they've experienced life in a microcosm of Native Americans throughout the country, from being a numerous populous culture to being decimated by disease and brought down to a tenth of their numbers even before Americans arrived. Plus, they've been studied a whole lot, so I can actually say something. Um, so why study the Ho-Chunk? Why talk about them in particular? Um, that last little comment isn't a throwaway. Of all of these groups up here, Ho-Chunk are among the most studied native peoples in North America because they have a lot of good stories. And early Americans, when they wanted to study Indians, uh, really got interested in studying texts and myths. 
And so they would go to study the religion of a native group and they'd say, all right, tell me your creation story. And then tell me your story about where evil comes from. Not all cultures had these stories, but the Ho-Chunk do. Uh, and so they were recorded. And they've been recorded and studied for hundreds of years. So I can talk about the Ho-Chunk with confidence without revealing anything that is currently secret or that they currently would rather not be shared. So we can talk about them with a slightly cleaner conscience. Who are the Ho-Chunk? They are an indigenous people that originated specifically here, southern Wisconsin, from another group of people who, were, who originated here in southern Wisconsin. Remember the FG Mounds? Um, I might have talked to this group before. I, I don't know. I've talked somewhere in Whitewater about them. Um, the FG Mound people, those that built the FG Mounds, eventually grew and evolved into another culture we call the Oneata. The Oneata eventually grew and developed into a couple of other cultures, but most notably, the Ho-Chunk. And while the Ho-Chunk were displaced from Wisconsin, many were able to return. And never has Wisconsin existed where there hasn't been at least some Ho-Chunk presence. When are we talking about? Um, the Oneata would have emerged around 1200, be, uh, common era, and the Ho-Chunk, a couple hundred years after that. So they've been around for longer than our country. They've been around to the present day. If you haven't heard of Ho-Chunk, maybe you've seen one of these other names there at the bottom. Uh, the first two, different ways of writing the same word, Ho-Chunk, and the bottom one is what we used to call them, the Winnebago. If you grew up... Uh, any time around me, that's what you knew, knew them as first, the Winnebago. And if you're reading anything about the myths that I mentioned, you need to look for Winnebago because the old books use that term. We use the term Ho-Chunk because that's their name for themselves. The word Winnebago was introduced by outsiders. It was an Algonquin term to refer to a different tribe. The French asked the Algonquin, who are those people? The Algonquin said something that sounded kind of like Winnebago, and that's what the French wrote down. The term Winnebago translates roughly to the people of the stinking waters, um, which could then be translated to smelly people. Uh, and if you read French documents, they, they're referred to as stinkards. Not exactly flattering. Uh, the Algonquin word for stinkards Stinking water just meant stagnant. So in other words, they were the people who lived by lakes. Uh, not offensive, but still not their own word for themselves. Their own word would be Ho-Chunk, which like most native people's self-name means the people. Who are we? We're the people. This people. And if I get to talk about religion, let's start big. Uh, I don't know if we can actually say that any religion has themes. When, it, when you're talking about any other religion that we know about, that you interact with, trying to come up with what is the reason for the religion or what are the themes of the religion. Um, you got to make something up, though, to give us big brush strokes. So we could say that uh, Ho-Chunk religiosity or spirituality really prioritizes four major themes. And the first is going to be kinship. Everything in this world is going to be understood as interrelated, bound to us through an interconnected web of kinship. Every animal, plant, or spirit is related to you in some way through some sort of familial relationship. And you know how to treat that animal or spirit when you know the relationship between the two of you. If it's an ant spirit, a U N, not A N T. Uh, if you treat that spirit like an aunt, that spirit will treat you like a niece or nephew. If it's a cousin, you treat that animal like a cousin, and it treats you like a cousin. And just like we have different feelings about and relationships with our different family members, so too you could understand your place in the world and how to understand every other being when you understood how you were related to them in whatever way. 
reciprocity would then be the ties that bind. Um, it is as close as you get to a universal ethos in Native American religions. Gift-giving cultures are an example of that. I treat you like a loving mother. You treat me like a mother should treat a son. If I treat you with respect, you'll likely treat me with respect. If I give you the gifts that are expected of a grandfather, then you will then give me the gifts expected as a grandchild. Reciprocity. If I treat you right, you then must treat me right. And the same goes for spirits. If long as I call upon the right spirit and perform the right relationship with that spirit, with whatever gifts uh, might express that relationship, that spirit will then reciprocate, treating me appropriately, which can give rise to power. And this is a thing that a lot of white scholars like to say as the central theme of Ho-Chunk religion, the acquisition of power. Uh, but that, I don't know about you, but power has a, a dirty connotation in my mind because of American politics. Um, uh, power, think like efficacy, the ability to make things happen to have an impact in your world. Before Europeans and Americans came here, we had a way of life, we'd followed the rules and rituals of that way of life, and we were able to live effectively in the world. But then things start to change. We keep living the same way, but we're not having the same impact in the world. Clearly then, something has gone awry. And so through the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th century, you see new spirits get discovered, new rituals get developed that will allow us to reclaim that power or efficacy, the ability to get those things that we need in order to have the life that we want. And then finally, dualism, um, which is just to say that in Ho-Chunk religion, there tends to be sets of paired opposites. There's a world above and a world below. The world below is divided into a, this world and the underworld. You've got a society that's divided into two different categories. Now we say this is a Ho-Chunk uh, element. It might just be a human thing. Humans tend to do this, think in terms of paired opposites, white, black, up, down. But it's something we see and recognize when studying not us groups like the Ho-Chunk. Certainly, Ho-Chunk religion is divided, or Ho-Chunk society is divided into uh, two sets. We're, we call them moieties in anthropology. They have a, a way of dividing up society, human beings, into one of two categories. The people who are above, or those who are above, and those who are below. It's a fancy way of saying that the clans of Ho-Chunk society, those subunits of political organization, are divided into two groups. And these two groups have religious or spiritual significance, cultural significance, without a whole lot of political impact. So they're meaningful within the culture, which of these two groups you're a part of. But then, underneath those two large subdivisions, all of Ho-Chunk society is then divided up into 12 clans. Each of these clans are then subdivided into a whole bunch of different lineages. And a lineage is a, a big family unit, um, a set of kin that are connected, and you know you're related to each other even if you don't exactly know how you're related to each other. It's like everyone who shows up at a family reunion, you know your family even if you don't know exactly how. Clans, you know your family. Um, so if you're looking for a marriage partner, chances are you're gonna look for someone outside your clan because you know chances of them being related a lot lower than in your clan. There are 12 recognized clans among the Ho-Chunk and I never remember all 12. So what do we got? We've got thunder, warrior, eagle, pigeon, bear, wolf, water spirit, deer, elk, buffalo, fish, and snake. Uh, 
depicted in that nice little logo that I shamelessly stole from the Ho-Chunk website. Each of these clans are traditionally and contemporary, contemporaneously, today, uh, responsible for certain ceremonies. Um, each one charged with certain social obligations. Um, they have a task to do in a given village. They have a responsibility for the larger Ho-Chunk society. And they have ceremonies interacting with certain spirits that only that clan can do, which is why each individual village has historically been made up of lineages from multiple clans. One clan knows how to start and keep the fire. One clan does the ceremonies that make sure to uh, bring the spring. Another, really good warriors. That's just a different job. But they, they're good with war. And there's a, a clan charged with being peacekeepers within the villages. Each clan is necessary, and it's only together that we can live effectively. Now, I wanted to shift to like talking about the cosmology, the big worldview, uh, the structure of the universe, so that we could like move in from the top down, but it didn't really make sense, so I rearranged everything. Um, rather, let's back into the worldview with stories, because again, they're really well documented, and I really like telling stories. So to talk about Ho-Chunk spirituality or religion, Let's start by recognizing that within that religion, there is a creator god named Earthmaker or Manuna, sometimes called the creator, sometimes called the great spirit. Earthmaker was the first thing, the first being to exist. Before the world, before the universe, Earthmaker woke up, and he was. And he looked around him and he began to create. Create from the flat plane of nothingness that he woke up on. He created all the various plants and animals, all the different types of spirits that populate the universe. He created human beings. It's said that either when he first woke up and realized that he was all alone, or after creating human beings and realizing that we lack any sort of protection. One of the two reasons, he began to cry. His tears fell upon the earth and carved out the hills and the mountains and eventually became the waters of the earth. Before he then uh, uh, is going to step back into the highest level of heaven where he resides to this day. Earthmaker has a hut that he lives in. And it's just for him, and for ages, he lived alone in this highest realm of existence. Some versions are going to say that he might have lived there with uh, one other, but we'll get there. Earthmaker creates. He creates uh, all the animals, all the spirits. He creates humans, steps back enter in the sons of Earthmaker. The sons of Earthmaker are beings hand-fashioned by Earthmaker. The implication is that the animals, the plants, maybe humans themselves were created, but not necessarily directly. Maybe you think spiritual or physical evolution, if you will. But these sons of Earthmaker are humanoid, like Earthmaker, but, and they have human-like form, but they are spiritual in essence and substance, like he is. They are more directly of his essence, so to speak. The first of these special beings that Earthmaker set to create is called Herskinina, or some variation thereof. He didn't exactly come out right. Um, his, one of his legs either uh, fell off or it never really separated from the first one. So he's sometimes called one-legged. Um, he wasn't made right in other reasons, too. He, uh, he's going to end up being the source of all that is bad and evil. And for his 
imperfections, he was cast off and disowned by Earthmaker. He's never actually called the son, and we just kind of leave him to a bit. He's cast off. He moves up to a godforsaken land, the north, um, from which all cold and pain and suffering comes from, Canada. <laughs> Next, Earthmaker looks to his creation and he sees human beings trying to live. And yet, we're kind of weak. All of the other beings have special powers. Spirits have supernatural abilities. Animals have either something to keep them safe or something to make them a good hunter. And humans are just kind of helpless and weak. So he gives to humans tobacco as a sacrament, a thing that we can gift to spirits and that they all want, but that only we can actually grow and offer as per the will of Earthmaker. But that is not enough to let us live at least not well, because from the north, Harris Ganina starts to corrupt all of the creatures that Earthmaker made, creating evil spirits, creating other races of beings that make our life difficult, like the giants, and a race of bodiless heads that roll on the ground and bite our feet. Um, it's part of the stories. Uh, so we have a lot of problems, and we need someone to help us against all of these evils. So Earthmaker creates a son whose name translates roughly as Trickster. And he sends him to us to help lead us in battle against all of these evil forces. His name's Trickster. That's kind of an indication of his personality. He, he's got a great sense of humor, uh, but can't really take the job of protecting humankind all that seriously. He's a good person, but not right for the job. So Earthmaker recalls him and gives him his own realm of the overworld or the heavens to oversee, a realm for people who have lived exceptionally good lives. And he sends down another son that he creates, Turtle. Turtle is actually the most warrior-like of these, which seems weird until you think of like a snapping turtle. Um, which are really aggressive and vicious, um, have a great natural weapon, they're walking around in armor all the time, they have a very short temper, that's Turtle. He comes down and he's mm, the frat guy of Earthmaker Sons. Um, he starts picking fights with not just evil spirits, but also with humans. Uh, he introduces war to them. He starts bragging about all of his uh, successes, both real and imagined, both on the field and with women. Okay, not right for this job. He gets recalled, and he, gives, is received, he is given a paradise in some sort of underworld for those who die violent deaths. God sends down another son, Bladder. Bladder is um, arrogant and self-centered. He's like a a bladder you use for water, he's puffed up on his own self-importance. Not right for the job, he gets recalled. He gets his own underworld too. There might be another son, at least in some stories there is. His name is Human Heads as Earrings. It, it's better when you don't translate it. Um, his name translates as human heads as earrings. Uh, he has a lot of success, especially against the giants. Uh, he's able to defeat a lot of the evil spirits. Uh, but the thing is, he's got human heads as earrings. And uh, when he's trying to be all serious, they keep making funny faces and sticking their tongues out at people. So no one can take him seriously as a leader. Uh, so he either gets killed and comes back to life, or depending on who's telling the story, he might not exist at all. And we just skip straight to the last one, which is hair or rabbit. Earthmaker sends us hair, um, and hair leads us in victory against all of the evil spirits. Any that he doesn't defeat all right, outright, he's able to push further away from this world, to push into the expanses of the heavens or to push lower into the earth so they don't bother us on a day-to-day. He is a messianic-like figure. He is a son of God 
sent down to protect human beings from all evil. According to the stories, Hare wants to understand what it's like to be human, so he even chooses, although he's already created, to be born of a woman, so that he would be both human and divine. And he attempts to make our life good and long-lasting. He creates agreements with the animals as to which ones will offer themselves for us for food and which ones we should be afraid of. He tries to save us from death so that we would never die. However, the ritual doesn't go right, so we do still have to deal with death. But so that he doesn't leave us helpless before it, he introduces a new religious ritual. The medicine rite. In case you don't know what a hair is, that's... I, that's a picture. I just thought it was cute. I wanted to stick it in. Uh, he introduces the Medicine Rite, which is a special religious um, organization or a subset of religious rituals that allows practitioners to avoid certain ills and difficulties that come in life. But perhaps most importantly, teach us about what we'll, we'll face in the afterlife on the road between here and our eternal resting place. And forewarned, and with this knowledge, we can then actually navigate the various realms of heaven all the way up to the hut of Earthmaker. And if you're able to make it that far, you can actually request to be reincarnated, to go back to Earth. So we're gonna have to die. He can't do that, but he, he can't get rid of that, but he wanted to make sure that you could have as much life as you would want. So you can go back and, if you know the teachings of the medicine rite, receive reincarnation up to four times because no one wants to come back more than four times. Um, all right, so the layers of the cosmos. We have an above world, we have this world, and we have below worlds. The above worlds or heavens are divided up into at least two because dualistic. The below worlds divided up into at least two as well, each presided over by one of the sons of Earthmaker. Hare doesn't get an afterlife. Instead, in at least some versions of this religion, he is the spirit most directly charged with overseeing this world, human beings and our ongoing existence. This world is then divided up into the cardinal directions. Uh, it's not true that the cardinal directions are important in every religion um, or even every Native American religion. However, they are important in Ho-Chunk religion. Each of the cardinal directions, north, south, east, west, has spiritual meaning, correspondence, symbolism. And according to historic cosmology, understanding of the world, there are, in each of the four directions, great island weights, um, special spirits who serve to hold down Earth. See, when Earthmaker created, his tears became the waters of this Earth surrounding this land, and it's underneath this land. Uh, and so the Earth kind of slides back and forth. It doesn't fit well underneath the dome of heaven. So to help give it some stability, Earthmaker set really heavy spirits in each of the four directions to help weight down the Earth. And also sent uh, giant serpents um, to like tie the Earth down to the layers below, again, to help tether it in place. In each of the four directions, there are also spirit villages. Just like we humans have cities and villages and towns, so do the non-human spirits. Buffalo spirits have their own village. Bear spirits have their towns. Water spirits, thunder beings, they all have their own towns. And if you know the right ceremonies or you know the way to go, you can walk there just as clearly as you can walk to Madison. I did mention some spirits, so let's pull out a couple of those, namely thunderbirds and water spirits, as they are the two types of spirits that probably pop up the most in Ho-Chunk religion, historically and today. Uh, thunderbirds, which may or may not be the same thing that 
uh, are called thunderers, are giant birds associated with thunder and lightning. They are potent spiritually, and those who actually catch a glimpse of one are forever changed, unable to go back and interact with the human world quite the same way. They are proud, they are clean, uh, they sometimes serve as messengers of other spirits or gods, and they're generally good, but that doesn't mean that they serve human beings. They're another species, just like us. They got their own thing going on, but if you know how to interact with them, you know the right relationship, you know how to treat them, again, reciprocity will rule. But there are also water spirits out there in the world, the mortal enemy of thunderbirds. Water spirits are shape changers. They're, we call them water spirits. Their Ho-Chunk name um, translates as problematic people, uh, complicated people, difficult people. That's a good one. Um, but they are shape changers. They, are, in their natural form, are part reptile, part cat, part snake, part elk. But again, they can appear however they want. Often you will find them underneath the, the surface of water or even in caves underground, and they have powers over water. They're not exactly evil, but they are difficult to deal with. And they also don't always put human beings first in their consideration. So they have power, you can interact with them, but you need to know how to treat them right. Yeah, we're not going over all these words. Uh, <laughs> just like there is a cosmology, there is an anthropology in any religion. Cosmology, your view of the cosmos. Your anthropology, your view of the human being. And in Ho-Chunk spirituality, the human being is both flesh and spirit. The word for spirit, um, I don't know how to pronounce that, the one on the left, uh, is understood as a reflection of the flesh. Likewise, the flesh is a reflection of the spirit. When you are born, you are both simultaneously. Changes to one can impact the other and vice versa. And when you die, your flesh returns to the earth, does the thing the flesh does. Your spirit, however, moves on to a realm to the afterlife. It journeys towards the west, towards the setting sun. There it receives an afterlife either in one of the many celestial villages that we live in, or in one of the different realms of existence, the above realms or the under realms. Lots of options, but life doesn't end here. Nor is there judgment based upon if you've been a good person or bad person. There are different afterlives. People who are jerks or who are violent are probably gonna end up in celestial villages with other people like them, because that's probably what they would choose. But that's not to say that Ho-Chunk spirituality is without ethics. It matters how you live. It's just you're not being threatened with a certain punishment if you don't do it. If reciprocity is the universal ethos, the ethic that underlines that is generosity. To treat a person, a spirit, a good spirit, a bad spirit, a human being the correct way, you give. You give with whatever you have. If you have a lot, you give a lot. If you have a little, you give with what you do have, your time, your affection, your wisdom. The practice of Ho-Chunk religion then can have a more uh, concrete form as well. We've talked about stories and spirits, we've talked about ethics, but of course there is the practice of Ho-Chunk religion. There are rituals. Every clan has rituals that are done every year that only that clan can do. There are religious societies, groups of shaman who have um, ceremonies and rituals that only they can do to interact with particular spirits. There are feasts, 
village-wide, clan-wide celebrations for religious objects called war bundles, or to evoke this, uh, the potent spirituality of success that will give you success in war. Have a feast, have a community event, have everyone get up, raise everyone's spirits, and in that moment, you evoke that spirit of spiritual potency that will give you success in war or in hunting or in farming. Life cycle rituals, adoption ceremonies, there are hundreds of rituals doing everything you would expect a religion to do. But perhaps the one that stands out the most to outsiders is the fast and vision quest. That as part of your maturation ceremony, to moving from a child to an adult, many people will choose to undergo a fast. And during this fast, which can last a couple of days, there will be isolation and prayer in the hopes that during the course of this ritual, a spirit will make itself known to you and reveal its relationship to you, how exactly you're related, thus how you're supposed to treat them. Once you've established this relationship, you know you have a closer tie to that spirit the rest of your life. You have someone that you can call on when things are difficult, someone who's going to help shape who you are and how you live. The idea of, was it guardian spirits or um, uh, animal totems that uh, has filtered out into American pop culture, uh, that's a myth about Native American religions invented by people who don't know better. Uh, this is about as close as you can get in an actual Native American religion. A fast, a vision, a spirit revealing its relationship to you, and then creating an ongoing relationship with you through some sort of familial norm. Of course, Ho-Chunk exists over time, and like any people, new religions come in from outside. Just like in any given town in America today, you have lots of different religions, most of which didn't start there. Same goes for Ho-Chunk. In any given Ho-Chunk community, you have lots of religions, including Christianity, but also other Native American religions that have started among other peoples, but in gotten incorporated into the Ho-Chunk way of life. Those are just some names I'm throwing up. So that is a, a, a quick overview that, that mm, normally it takes two weeks um, <laughs> for the Ho-Chunk in my Native American religion class. Uh, that was about 40 minutes, um, but hopefully at least we were able to convey a sense of a Native American community that existed in Wisconsin prior to Euro-American uh, Euro settlement that has continued to exist, that has those elements you would expect among a Native American religion, but also it's practiced in a way that is contemporary. It's practiced by people just like you and me um, and fulfills all of those needs that you would expect from a contemporary way of spirituality. So, um, questions about it? I'll come around with the mic microphone here. I was just going to say microwave. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> here you go. I don't think I'd pass your class. This reminds me of Harry Potter a little bit. <laughs> I have a, a two-part question. Seriously, though, please. Yeah. Who, how did you, that's obviously not a book of Ho-Chunkism, right. uh, so you had to dig this all out, I assume. How did you go about that, number one? Number two, how do the Ho-Chunk natives relate to the dualism of Ho-Chunk spirituality as versus the white world? Mm. Mm. That's great. Um. <laughs> Uh, the first part is actually the, uh, one of the easiest. Um, uh, there are books that do record, uh, quote, Ho-Chunk myth, because again, um, Europeans and Americans were just fascinated coming across a culture that did have a set of myths, a set of stories 
that when asked, they could present. Many native peoples didn't. So a lot of this is written down, um, but never in one place. I've been doing this for 20 years now. Um, and so I learned little bits here and there. But as I've been doing this, I've, I've gotten less comfortable talking about native peoples um, who are not as well studied. There are plenty of bits, information about a culture that have been pried out by seemingly well-meaning missionaries. Coming into a community, befriending natives, asking questions about their culture, and then using what they know to try to dismantle that culture and dismantle the people. Learning information about their religion that's only shared to close friends or family that they then write in books and pass on to others. I, I became a specialist in this before I found out that's the foundation of this field, and I don't do that anymore. Um, so the Ho-Chunk, what I said, this is public information. Uh, you can find with a couple of months of pulling up some library books, a couple of internet searches, this is stuff that's well known. Um, it just, you have to be intentional about gathering it. Uh, as for the dualism though, um, that's rad. Uh, in Ho-Chunk, it's led less, as less clear as within a cousin culture, if you will, Lakota uh, or Dakota. Similarly, has this dualism, but um, we do have documents among that community of this incorporation of dualism in the development of an Indian identity. If things are divided into two parts, then they started to understand themselves as Indian, a term invented by outsiders, projected and pushed on a bunch of different people that outsiders all thought were in the same thing. Lakota took this term Indian and gave it meaning, said, all right, we're Indian, and then you're white, and then used the symbolism of the two things, the sky and the earth, the colors red and the colors white, the birds and the four-legged creatures, to create a new set of rituals that serve to bridge those two parts. And in so doing, bridge the sky and the earth, but also bridged the white and the native world. They created rituals to help abrade, to uh, wear down that line that separated Indian world and white world. We don't have documents of Ho-Chunk doing that, but I would bet that there are. Yeah. I'll be right there. Yeah, she's coming. You mentioned that First Nation was a term used by the Canadians yeah. with reference. Is there a legal term in the United States to refer to the native peoples? <laughs> um, all of them. Um, uh, the term uh, Native American, Indian, and American Indian all appear in uh, U.S. legal uh, documents. Uh, depends on what decade or century we're talking about. Uh, but they are all used um, at the state or federal level. How about now? Uh, today, uh, Indian and Native American seem to be um, the term of choice, um, at least in legal documents, uh, among people. Indigenous people? Uh, indigenous people can be used, but generally if you're wanting to refer to a group that is more inclusive. Native American, according to U.S. Uh, law, or Indian, according to U.S. law, is going to include any indigenous person from North and South America, including Alaska. Um, why do we have to say including Alaska? I don't know, but it's always specified. That's part of North America. Uh, indigenous people would also be a term to describe people from Africa or, or Australia, though. So, catch all. Other questions? At UW-Whitewater, our classes on these topics are called American Indian Studies. Yeah. Um, when I grew, where I grew up, um, down south, um, and when I grew up, that term was um, seen as unacceptable among many of the native peoples of southern United States. But that was the term that 
native peoples of Wisconsin for the past couple of decades have been preferring. So again, if, if you have a question as to what's the right term, ask the people you're talking to and use that one. How about for those of us who were born here? Born here? You are American. <laughs> yeah. Native? We are, you are not, uh, you are native to the country, small n, but you are not uh, native. native American. You actually raise a, a, a pretty problematic point. Um, a lot of people, white people, claim to be native, right? Um, so what counts as native? Well, while Native American can be an ethnicity, just like Italian American or African American, Native American is unique in that it is an ethnicity that actually has legal ramifications. You can identify as Native American if you feel that's who and what you are, or if you have an ancestry or heritage, but that's different than being legally acknowledged as a Native American. And for that, and therefore to get incorporated in the laws that pertain to Native Americans, uh, you actually need documentation. Uh, documentation of ancestry, uh, as befits the standards that we Americans created and imposed on Native Americans. We invented a category. We invented the method that you have to prove to get into it, uh, which was based on racism. Uh, I race. Changes uh, from century. Uh, I think right now we're at uh, an eighth. Um, there's a problem though with that, right? Um, one is, is who has those documents, right? Very few of us. Uh, two, a lot of native peoples were growing up on reservations that they were forced onto that had no medical, uh, professional medical care and therefore have no birth certificates. So when late, forcing their later descendants to prove in our legal courts with documentation, that's documentation that we did not give them, so it can't be done. And then of course it's based on blood, which was never the content of what it means to be family in native communities. You're a family, you're a member of this community if you're a member of this community. If you're a part of this familial relationship network, if you're a cousin to that person, a brother to that person, regardless of what your genetics say. So it's an outside standard. Um, but yeah, you can identify as Native American. That's problematic uh, if you like look like this, for example. Um, but that's different than being legally recognized as Native American. Uh, do you have a question back there? Oh, okay. You're making me go to the corners here. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, it makes more sense. Yeah. Thanks. Hi. Um, so in a number of the clans that you mentioned um, towards the beginning, the 12 clans, a lot of them have um, animalistic or spirit, um, nature-based spirits as almost their um, symbol mm -hmm. of that clan. And in the process of westernization, colonialization, whatever you want to call it, taking over the West, a lot of those species, for example, buffalo I see up there, wolves, um, are either suppressed in region or almost ex and completely exterminated. Mm -hmm. um, now that some of those issues are coming more to light and ecologically speaking, some of those species are being restored or attempted to being restored, mm -hmm. how does that relate to the clans themselves and how maybe they feel spiritually connected to their spirit um, guides mm -hmm. or um, what types of rituals they're doing? Like, Yes, open-ended question. What is <laughs> yeah. Um, Native peoples are active in uh, restoration efforts of um, endangered and, what's the step up from that, threatened uh, indigenous species. Some sacred imp uh, native, some sacred uh, species for native peoples have simply disappeared. In Wisconsin, many of the animals that were once important have just, been pushed out of the region, right? You don't really find buffalo ro roaming wild in Wisconsin anymore. 
Likewise, many animals that, while not sacred or identified with the clan, were staple foodstuffs, um, have been nearly lost. Some of these clans uh, have started to introduce their own efforts to create uh, wild stock on the lands they own. There's a, I just read yesterday, a deer population that was uh, recreated here in Wisconsin um, uh, on a particular reservation. Uh, and the hopes was that they were going to raise it as a foodstuff and a trade good with Europeans as venison. Um, that second part hasn't happened. Uh, but they were able to reintroduce uh, the species. Likewise, the wild Mustang population, the buffalo uh, population, primarily focused on the Great Plains right now, is often supported by clans that have a totemic association. The Buffalo Clan, for example, really supportive of efforts regarding the buffalo. Yeah. Other questions? OK. Well, yeah, sure. Is there still an American Indian student organization on campus? There is. Yes, sir. Um, they're still meeting. They're still having talks for, on their own. Uh, this year, I believe they're focused on the Oneida. Um, and they've had some uh, guest speakers. And there will be a trip to uh, the Oneida community later this semester. They're, they're a fairly active group on campus, yeah, for sure. Great. Well, Professor Gaynor will stay here a bit if you have some more questions for him. But please join me in thanking Professor Michael Gaynor for his talk today. Thank you for coming.